Welcome to Film Courage. This is episode 160. I'm Karen Warden. And I'm David Brannon. Our guest today are independent film marketing and publicity specialist and, and now author Sherry Candler and filmmaker, author, founder of Hybrid Cinema, John Reese. You may remember Sherry and John from prior shows. Most recently, they appeared alongside Jeffrey Winner of the Film Collaborative regarding their team effort with the Film Collaborative on selling your film without selling your soul. Recently, John launched the distribution company Hybrid Cinema in order to help filmmakers navigate the ever-changing world of film distribution and marketing. The film uh, Joffrey, Mavericks of American Dance, is Hybrid's second full release um, of the film following the graffiti documentary Bomb It. And let's see and here. <laughs> I know I'm going to be playing a clip in just a moment. Yeah. Um, you know, but let me let me talk about the film. Joffrey Mavericks of American Dance is written and directed by Bob Hercules. Um, Sherry Candler. That yeah, that's, that's I was going to say that. That's, that's a probably powerful film name. that's probably the greatest name in <laughs> you know in, in filmmaking history. <laughs> Bob Hercules. Yeah, that's, that's love that one. Uh, Sherry Candler is involved with marketing partnerships and community outreach regarding the film. We are proud to say that this is the fourth time that Sherry and John have been on Film Courage. These two share the record for most appearances on our show. With that, please welcome via telephone Sherry Candler and in person John Reese. Welcome, guys. Welcome. Thanks for having yeah. us here. Yeah, thanks for being here, Sherry. Thanks. Hi. There we go. Hi, we Hi. have Sherry Yay, on board. Sherry. Hey, Sherry. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we had a little drama a behind, the, behind the, scenes. the scenes. Yeah, for some reason the number just wouldn't connect there, Sherry. So we're we're glad that you called us. It's the radio gods yeah. testing us. <laughs> you know, we love being able to connect people here on the show. We always try to bring people together. So we encourage you listening to connect with John at John, you know, at JohnReese dot com, as well as on Twitter, John underscore Reese, and also Sherry at SherryCandler dot com and Sherry Candler on Twitter. And if you're listening live and you'd like to connect with us. You can do so at Film Courage or hashtag Film Courage. So something we've never really heard from the two of you, whether it be this show or anywhere else, is a snapshot of the standard day in the life of Sherry Candler and yes, John Reese. That's right. Okay, so let's, without... <laughs> okay, who wants to start? Sherry, Sherry we're going to... Ladies first, <laughs> let's start with you. Please give us a highlight starting with the moment you wake up. What is a, a day in the life of Sherry Candler? Okay. Um, well, about a year and a half ago, I got an Android, which is kind of like the curse of my life now because I sleep with it next to the bed. So uh -oh. before I even get up, I'm already checking email, Facebook, and Twitter <laughs> so just to see what I have facing before I even get out of bed. Um, sometimes I even answer stuff while I'm still laying there if it's quick. Um, so I haven't even turned the computer on or sat down at the desk or anything. Um, I try not to do that in the middle of the night. I have heard of people not being able to sleep at 2 a.m., so they fiddle around with their phone. I try not to do that because I that will wake me up and I will be up, so I, I don't do that. But um, probably don't turn off the computer until 11 o'clock at night, so so I'm usually still up late doing whatever um, until 6 or 7 in the morning before I, I check it again. Um, you know, then start off with the day... Um, turning on the computer and coming back and thinking about what 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 do I have to post this morning um, on Facebook? What do I need? I need to check, you know, what's going on on Twitter overnight for any European or Asian audiences that might have caught on to something that we did. Um, checked all the Google alerts to see if any interesting stories come up that I should be posting about or something that I could blog about later. I try to think at least a week or two in advance of what I'm going to be blogging about as far as the film or for myself or for any other project that I'm working on. Um, some, I have a lot of things that are in draft that I want to add to later, <laughs> and I'll start off with one or two sentences to remind me of where I was trying to go with this story and, and come back and add things to it. I also search around on the Internet, see if I can find any photos or videos that I can link to within the story um, that will make it more you know, rich story bring it to life um i don't know i mean that's sort of a lot of my day i take conference calls with other people talking about you know they handle other aspects of the release so finding out have we got any new dates added what's coming up in the next week you know the publicist might have a story that's going to be placed and she needs a couple of uh, references from people who are in the cast of the film or something like that and do we need to make a connection with them and arrange that with their schedule um 
you know, are there any requests that for posters or anything like that? Usually the bookers are handling those and, and getting that out, but just, you know, keeping an eye on what's going on and is everybody doing what they're supposed to do? Um, because sometimes I get emails back, you know, directly that, that the bookers are not in touch with the people who are hosting it directly. So sometimes I get those, but not very often. Um, you know, John and I talk probably once a day, but every few days, for sure, on email all the time, but sometimes on the phone, um, you know, just, it, that's, it's constant work. It's constantly something needing to be written or something needing to be found and posted, interacting with people on the Facebook channel. If they've seen what I posted that day, I'll give it like 15 or 20 minutes because some of them are really quick <laughs> about their comments, um, going back and seeing, you know, what was the reaction so far. I try not to be so hair trigger of, oh, gosh, we haven't gotten a comment in 15 minutes. You know, that's <laughs> probably not realistic. <laughs> um, but, you know, checking around to see if there's anything that needs needs attention. Um, and then I also do minimize things uh, for a few hours just so I can concentrate on writing or researching or um, doing other work so I'm not constantly thinking about I need to you know, b respond to that or check on it right away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's basically, that goes wow. on all day. Um, and thinking about even weeks ahead of time, you know, sh I, I need to do some research in a certain area of the, of the town where I know we're going to have a screening so I can send emails to the directors of those schools and let them know that the screening is happening and here's the details and here's the trailer in case you haven't heard about it. And, and then if we get emails back asking more information or wanting us to send them postcards, answering that kind of correspondence. Um, yeah, so that's what sort of goes on in my day. Wow, constantly keeping in touch, it sounds like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And for John? Uh, for me, yeah, I try not to look at my phone when I wake up. I think it would be too depressing um, because it's like in the morning there's usually, especially in the fall when we're in the thick of things, there are probably 200 emails came in like since I turned off the computer. So it's kind of like too daunting, you know? So I usually... Uh, make a cup of coffee for my wife, um, wake my kids up, put the dogs out, <laughs> um, drive my kids to school, and then then after that, when I'm then I start the day, and it's usually it all depends on what's happening, you know, which part of the release we're in. So you know, if we're just getting the site up, a lot of it is dealing with the website designer and dealing with, and also if we're early in the release, talking about the bookers about what the strategy is going to be, talking to Sherry about what the marketing strategy is going to be, talking to the publicist. You know, it's like it's a lot of meetings like that, just kind of a lot of it, it's very similar in a sense. And this is why, you know, going back to the producer of marketing and distribution, I really feel it's it feels very I've produced films before and it's very much like being a producer. You're managing a lot of different aspects of the release and you're also and reaching out to people and engaging people. And so recently we just closed the Canadian deal for the film. I'm reaching out to foreign sales representatives. So it's writing emails to them and keeping in touch with them and you know, kind of like we're wrapping up the, the bookers on the film, so we're transitioning into keeping that on in our office and how that's going to transition in our office. And, you know, we have New York coming up, so Sherry and I were just talking about, like, oh, what else can we do to promote that makes financial sense to promote the, the theatrical release in New York? So it's all every week, but it's always communicating with people and... Um, but I probably do more email than social media, as Sherry always is on my case about. And uh, um, just because it's like that's kind of like it's more it's because I, in a sense, am more I would say I'm more managing than engaging with fans, which I think Sherry's doing more directly is my impression. It, so I have a few. Anyway, that's I guess what it'd be. And then, you know, because the Joffrey is not. And I think this is also true with Sherry, but I won't speak for her, but it's not the only thing in our life. Like I have other clients that I talk to. I am talking to filmmakers about their projects to see whether it makes sense for us to work together. And then I'm potentially watching their films or talking to them about what their strategies for their film should be, et cetera, that kind of thing. So. Right. And taking it in another direction, I have to say that it is a very seductive thing to put a tweet out there or a post on Facebook and then get that instant reaction back. And people have joked about the fact that down the line we may need um, – you know, uh, treatment centers for social media addiction because it is. A, I mean, I, I I say that jokingly, but it is a very 
you know, we, we don't have a phone for that reason because it is very um, seductive to put that out there. And then I see um, it in my 12 year old daughter. Mm -hmm. I mean, I actually have to limit her time and it's just kind of like you're done. You know, it's like and it's like and it's like it's almost withdrawal, you know, and it's like oh, and totally. I think it's, you know, so there are. Yeah, I, I'm probably the opposite. I, you know, anyway, I. Um, so anyway, um, <laughs> or I'm well, very. Well, in addition to the to the work that we do for other people, we also have to keep up our own so, names, brands, yes. write things that are independent of that. Speaking, you know, uh, you you're running a business. You're also running things for other clients. So it's right. both, and for yourself, you yeah. know, and yeah. for your own. Like it, it's like you know, both Jerry and I speak a lot, and it's like rank, you know, the logistics of that, you know, it mm -hmm. takes. That's a lot. A lot. And so it's like kind proud. of like running that all of that stuff is like it's, you know, and it's 12 hours. It's I would say on average, it's 10 hours to 12 hours a day. And then when it's busy, it's like 16 hours a day, you right. know. And would you concur with that, Sherry? Yes, I, I'd say 12 is probably true. You mm -hmm. know, that that's something I, I, I working for yourself. You don't have to do the nine to five. So you could take an hour off and go to the gym or whatever, but that just means an hour after you eat dinner, you're back on the computer. You're making up the time later on in the evening when most people who have nine to five jobs have gone home. Um, so it's, it, I think that the time balances out during the day or probably even more so, um, but you can take these breaks in the daytime that other people who are um, employed with companies can't. And I, w I would say that this most people listening to the show who are independent filmmakers or artists would probably be nodding their heads. I mean, it's like a tough, it's a lot of work doing what we all do. It's yeah. like it's never, it's like it's never ending. But that's again what you sign up for in a sense. Mm. You know, yeah. we eat dinner behind the computers as well. You know, I mean, you, you both have your pulse on independent film and, and on the independent film success stories, and we, we just wanted to kind of start this show. Just, just you know, maybe maybe you guys can both highlight some of the big success, success stories we've seen in independent independent film over the last two years. We're just looking to to kind of draw some some inspiration here. Um. All right, sure. I'll, you know, I wrote it to me. Ride the Divide, and which is one of the films that I wrote about in selling your film without selling your soul. It, it, to me, that's a big success story. I mean, they were financially successful. They met their goals. You know, they've kind of like launched into a new kind of career path for themselves. That kind of like they use the model of that film to perpetuate that model. They continue to make films. They get their films out there simultaneously. You know, they they seem to have like made it work, and I just hats off to those guys. And I'll throw another one out. You know, I think Gregory Bain is pursuing a very successful model. I always, you know, I always put out a shout for Gregory. I think, <laughs> but I think, and I haven't. He's one person I haven't really written about much, but I really like what what Greg is is doing out there in the space. And who would you add, Sherry? Well, I think that it depends on what we're talking about when we say success. Mm -hmm. You know, are we taking, talking about box office success? Are we talking about um, overall profit success, which nobody really does know that number? Um, so I think that it's difficult to, to gauge what's considered. To, is it success when you get, um, when your film is not profitable, but you get more work um, yourself? Uh, yeah, so I, I, I think that, as far as successful people who it's uh, you know unclear as to how successful their film was lena dunham would be a success story out of tiny furniture d reese would be a success story out of pariah i don't know how financially successful those films were but for those two women they were very successful films that led to bigger career moves for them um you know, I think I like what Ava DuVernay is doing. She she has she's came from a publicist background. She's now a director of a film who that won at Sundance. Um, she's distributing it on her, you know, through her company that's also um, partnered up with a lot of the black film festivals across the United States to put not only her work out but a lot of other work out. Um, so I think that's a success of of meeting that goal. I don't know if we're only talking financial success. I don't know. Yeah, and I, I couldn't tell you because I don't know all, I, the, all the numbers behind and it. And hats off to Sherry for saying, because usually whenever I'm presented with that question, I always start off with, like, what do you mean by success? And to me, success is meeting your goals, whatever the goals happen to be, you know. And so, like, I don't know exactly how Gregory Bain's financials work out, but I know he's making a career for himself in the manner that he wants to as an independent filmmaker. And to me, that's successful. So, yeah. you know, and so and he's pursuing this new path. 
you know, he's not, you know, he's not just thinking as to what we were talking about earlier, which is like, oh, I'm going to get in a festival and that's going to launch my career. And blah. he's like rejected all that or doesn't th- doesn't count on any of that. He's pursuing his own path and making a success for himself, you know, out of using a variety of the new tools that are available. Of those examples of the, the handful that you gave, what were the key components? I mean, they all have very different niches and, and, and demographics that they're appealing to, what were the, the key components that you know brought them those success stories? I mean, I think the main thing is that each of them have a vision and a passion and they've stuck to it. You know, that's what mm-hmm. I would say is that, you know, the key component. And, you know, a um, you know, I for my two examples is to not be dependent on others and not be dependent on the old system to have to garner success from you know so that's what you know um but i you know i know that yeah so that's what i would say anything to add sherry um well i was going to say the probably my tiny furniture and pariah uh were completely dependent on having powerful champions (laughs) so i mean if, if that's one of your goals then that's what you need to do it's it's your uh, idea of success is going to be less revenue driven than it is to find very powerful people who want to champion you and can make things happen. It doesn't happen probably for the majority of people, but for some people that it does happen to. And it and both of those films started out in very prestigious festivals. They were good films, reviewed well, picked up, done all the usual stuff. I don't know, like I said, I don't know how financially successful they were, but for both of those women, if their goal was to be pushed ahead in their career they got it that was they met their that goal for those you know to continue to expand on this you know filmmaker zach forsman wrote in and and he would love to hear a little bit more about your personal successes and the lessons that you've learned along the way and i guess we'll direct that toward you sherry you know because you know you've had the opportunity to work um with, with filmmakers behind the scenes um you know what 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 can you talk a little bit about those successes and about the lessons you've learned along the way Wow. Um, I mean, I'm always striving for more personal success. I guess the whole fact that I'm on Film Courage gives me some <laughs> feeling of satisfaction. All right. We'd like to hear that. Three years ago, I, no one knew who I was at all. I mean, I'm literally somebody who started from zero and and worked for what whatever I have now is only the process of, of working hard, um, making um, some influential friends, proving my worth to them, um, actually working on projects that, that got some notoriety, notability, you know, were successful in their own way, um, helps lead to my success. Also constantly studying and keeping up with whatever is trending, you know, whatever thing is on the horizon and trying to figure out how does that fit into a helpful tool for what we're doing. And it's constantly changing. So it's not like something I go, yep, I'm, I'm an expert in this and I don't need anything. I don't, I don't need to learn any more about it. You're constantly learning. You're constantly spending that time. So there's the professional development that helps in your success. And then there's the practical development of, of actually going out and putting them into practice and seeing what works, what doesn't, why, you know, even when it fails, thinking why, why does this tool work for that and it doesn't work for this and what did work, what can you change? Um, so professionally, I guess that's what I've learned is to, it, you get as much out of it that you put into it. And also being helpful is really important. Like people really respond to that way more than hoarding information, than um, being secretive or being selective constantly um, about who you speak to. I'm pretty open as far as as talking to lots of different people from lots of different backgrounds and um, and getting inspiration and ideas even from a lot of times outside of the filmmaking community and. Um, trying to apply it in some way that I think is useful for what I do. John, John I know you, you uh, advocate the 50-50 rule, meaning, you know, if, if you have $100,000, if that's your budget, then then half of that should go toward making the film and half of that should go towards marketing distribution. You know, when you're approached, I mean, how many filmmakers do you see that actually set down, set aside a, a, reasonable, a reasonable amount of money where they have to market and distribute their films? Are, are you seeing that yet? Um, unfortunately, no. Um, a little bit more and more. Um, not as much as um, I would like to see out there, you know. And, um, you know, there are some 
filmmakers that, you know, are, you know, I'm working with one now. It's like, well, we're shooting our film. We need to raise more money. But it's like there's very few people that do it at inception. And I'm always kind of saying, you know, okay, so you have $100,000, really slot 50 of that away for audience engagement, which I view as all distribution and marketing, like slotting that away, you know, because I just say you'll be in such better shape than if you just spend all your money on on making the film and then you come to someone like me or anyone and say, oh, I have, I'm done. You know, I have no more resources. And because basically the that world of uh, D. Reese and um, Lena Dunham, it's like the 1% of 1%. You know, end up with those kind of deals, and they still exist. And the problem with those deals is that then it kind of reinfuses the myth, the mythology of the old system that used to be more robust for filmmakers. And when there were fewer filmmakers and a higher percentage of filmmakers, you know, got some financial success out of that old fi uh, festival acquisition system. And so that mythology is refreshed every time something like that happens. Um, but what most filmmakers don't still seem to understand is that's only really for one percent max mm. you know there's 45 35 to 45 thousand new feature films every year 600 end up in the festival circuit as a whole 200 end up in sundance maybe on a great year 40 end up with some sort of decent financial deal and one will end up with a d re scenario every two years you know sherry when, when these filmmakers approach you uh, you know, I, Sorry to be so. I don't mean to be so. No, no. I, 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 sometimes I, I, I feel like I'm so depressing and like you know <laughs> paternalistic and like have my finger wagging out there and just because we were talking about that earlier. But it's just kind of like you know, let's you know the world's there. You're just let me put it in a more positive spin. You're so much better off if you plan for something else. Like if you work on this is what we do in the IFP filmmaker labs. Like okay, so maybe that will happen to you. Great. Okay, maybe that'll happen. So it, because it happened to D. Reese, who had Pariah in the labs, but everyone else no, and that's why also Sundance set up Sundance Artist Services because they even saw that most of their filmmakers didn't end up like D. Reese from Pariah or whoever you know mm -hmm. Lena. Dun most mm -hmm. of the filmmakers that are even at Sundance don't end up that way. So they set up a system to help those filmmakers. So you filmmakers out there need to think and help yourself. Like really kind of think about I'm making this film. What do I want from it and how how am I going to achieve that if no one else is going to give that to me, which most likely is not going to happen? Well, I think the realism is important instead of just kind of, oh, follow your bliss and, and all that and, and, and the money will come. I, I think that the realism is mm -hmm. important. So, no, I don't think that that's that you're being a downer. Yeah. You know, and, and, and when John says we, we spoke, you know, we, we did a, We did our pre-interview with John yes. before we came to the studio. So we got John all warmed up. And he did. So when, when you hear him reference, he, he's referencing our outside right. the studio video that we've already done. And, and Sherry, you know, that just makes me wonder this whole kind of scenario. Is that what you often face is that filmmakers essentially have. Have have run run through all their money, and yet they're coming to you and saying like, "Hey, Sherry, we have no money, but can you help us? You know, get this movie out there, get this movie seen, and help us make money." Is that is that what you're faced quite often with? Four or five emails a week okay. <laughs> of that situation, and I and I, you know, I I had to think. Besides, maybe I try not to just delete those emails. I always try to go back to them with something, even though it's you know it's it's almost always a sorry can't help you. Um, here I give them the idea. Okay, you don't have any money. Everything that you need to know about how to do this is free on the internet. Now you have to spend time because you didn't spend money. You don't have money to spend. And I'm not going to do that. I have already spent my time, and I figured that that is valuable. So that, that's what I sell. So when you come to me and you tell me, I'd like you to take all the time that you spent and, and work for me for free, mm -hmm. or work for me for maybe a percentage of whatever I can get. No, that's not an attraction. I don't want to be an owner in your film. I'm not going to do that. You, if you can find somebody else to do that, great, but I'm not going to do that. Um, mm -hmm. But I can point you in directions of places where you can go and educate yourself. I would point them straight. Them I have a place. To, I have a place to point. I have a place to point them. They can go to johnreese.com store sure. backslash store, well, and I actually have me. and I actually have sales, hot doc sales, because I'm going to be at hot doc. So there's hot doc sales on think outside the box office and you selling go. your film without selling your soul in various combinations. And there for like twenty bucks, you can get both books, you know, and read those, you know, and for what, twenty what, bucks. What's the promo code? Do you have a promo no? Code? There's no, no promo no, code. No, 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 it's okay. just like it's the hot for the next month. It's the hot doc special. It's it's like, there you, you know, go. 
prices slashed. So 20 bucks for two books, you know, and, you know, you spend a month reading those and you'll, you know, and I get filmmakers all the time. It's like, I released my film with your book. You know, it's like, great. Good job. I'm happy. I, you know, it's like, Absolutely. you know, and, um, you know, so it's like, you know, great. And then some people times people come to me and Sherry to want more help. And then, then obviously we have to charge them for that. But, you know, but you can, the information is out there. You can do what we did. If you have no money, you know, the, there are possibilities. I hate to say that because I don't want filmmakers just still ending up with no money, you know, and, um, you know, I, I want more filmmakers like this one film that I'm working with now where they don't even, they're, they're barely, they're not even shooting yet. And they, you know, it's like, well, when are we going to start audience engagement? It's like, okay, we'll get going soon. You know, it's like, and, and that's great. You know, it's like, those are, I want more of those, but unfortunately there's that it's still a small, a little small piece, a tiny, and hopefully eventually it will, 10 years. I mean, we're in a transitional period, hopefully within five to 10 years, everyone will be thinking in this way. Mm -hmm. Sherry, how many filmmakers can you name right now that have at least 15,000 fans on Facebook? And does this matter? I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) um, Because I've always contended that 15,000 fans on Facebook looks really great. How many of them actually are going to do anything for you. Mm. That's your real number. Um, it doesn't take very much at all for people to click like and then never come back and you fall out of their feed and you can't count on them. Probably a better gauge is how many people have 15,000 email addresses that they can directly contact mm, when okay. they need to. Because mm-hmm. um, those people have actually given you permission to contact them. People who just click like on your Facebook page, you, you, there, there's really no way to contact them outside of your Facebook page. And if they're not um, visiting you constantly or you don't continue to show up in their in their news feed, after a while they forget that they ever liked your page and they don't keep up with what's going on there. So I don't like to use Facebook as a gauge of how many fans you have. I know a lot of distributors do that, though, so it's worth it if you can get people to click like, but just know that that's not an automatic people to count on. It's certainly not automatic sales. You can say, I have 15,000 fans times uh, $20 a DVD. How much does that make? <laughs> They're not all going to buy, you know? <laughs> um, so that doesn't really, it's not that much of a gauge to I tell think, you. I mean, it looks yeah. good, but uh, can I, I just, don't think. Hey, sorry, Sherry, can I jump in a little bit? Sure. Yeah. So I was just going to say that, um, you know, I think I totally agree with everything Sherry's saying, and I think it's all it is truly about engagement. And like if if you want to see someone who really kind of works the system well and kind of engage as well as a filmmaker, I always refer people to Ed Burns, you know, because he and he actually is able to he cultivates his audience. He's on there all the time. He responds to people constantly. And so that when he says my film's coming out and please go to iTunes and help me get into the top 10. Those people are loyal to him because they're engaged and I hats off to him because he has a really great talent at that. And granted he, you know, had some cred beforehand, but you know, he's built, you know, and so he was already a name, but he did kind of like, he's, he hasn't just just taken that celebrity and just slept on it, you know, and done nothing with, he's really worked hard to develop that audience. And he's gone back, talk about like what we were talking about earlier, where you're just, he stopped working the studio system. He started going back to his roots of making films for $15,000 and taking them straight to his fans. And he's doing a great job with it. He just said, this system doesn't work anymore. I spend years developing films that never get off the ground. And I'm just going to go back to Brothers McMullen, what I did with Brothers McMullen. I'm going to make a film. And I, I know I'm, I'm responsible for distribution and marketing. No one's going to do that for me. I have to plan for that. And I'm going to engage my fans. I'm going to make films, one film a year on this small budget and we're going to take it straight to people I'm going to engage with them. Mm. And so, and you'll see different things that he does. He tries different things, you know, so it's, it's good to follow people. So again, I think Gregory Bain is active. Zach is out there. Zach Forsman, who I think called it, I think he's interesting, you know, look at other filmmakers. King is a thing. Are, you know, look at filmmakers who are really using the tools and engaging with people, you know, and, and follow them and use them as models. Mm-hmm. And Tiffany Schlain. Tiffany Schlain, mm-hmm. Gregory Bain, I'll say again, you know, it's like, you know, there's, you know, God, Greg, you owe me a dinner or something. <laughs> um, and uh, so, um, you know, th- look at filmmakers who are out there kind of like really 
communicating with people and see how they do it and, you know, see how that fits within your, and that's what I recommend to my students at CalArts who don't do, you know, it's like, you know, look at people who are doing what you want to do and, you know, see how you fit in there and emulate in your own, but in your own way. Is there a part? And it does also set my teeth on edge when people go, oh, but Ed Burns, he came up, and Kevin Smith, they came up through the, through the system. Of course, it's easy. Yes, they're going to start off with more fans than you are when you start from zero. But there are so many people who are in that system who don't care about co- connecting directly with their fans. They don't do that. They have an agent. They have a talent manager. They don't, they don't have to talk to people. You know, that, that's the attitude change with those guys that's really important is they do feel like that's important. They, they aren't going to be at the whim of, uh, you know, every faceless person who comes to the box office and the next week you're the flavor of the week, you know, and, and then you're not. They have a direct audience they can go to and, 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 and that will support them. That's a different mindset than most people who work in the system. Yeah, I like what Joe Wilson of Vampire Mob said. He said, start with one person. And just build from there. And in keeping with that, do you have a preference uh, of Facebook versus Twitter? Or again, it's the same animal, but it's the level of engagement. It is I just you have to do. I just recommend doing both. You both. Know, it's okay. just, and they're just mm-hmm. different. You know, Sherry can talk to this probably more than I can. Well, I was going to say, Facebook is hard to argue against not using when they have 800 million users. I mean, it must so, be up to a billion so to now. Say, it's be you've a got billion to now. find some pity there who likes what you do in some capacity. It may not be your only tool. There may be other places, too. Especially when they change their platform every eight months and you have to redo true. everything to that's, conform to their platform. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Yes, you shouldn't build your whole audience on social media. You should, you know, you should also have your own. Which real is what presence. Sherry and I preach a lot that, okay, use the existing platforms because that's where people are but don't rely on those platforms to be the sole places where your audience lives you have to have your own sites so that you have your own direct relationship with your audience Mm -hmm. why are independent filmmakers afraid to day and date their films john why don't we start with you um uh i think it's kind of like fearful of rights and rights consequences, I would think, you know, and then fearful that they might think they might get a theatrical and how that's going to affect it. I don't, I, are filmmakers th- fearful of day and date? I you think know, that we more just don't, more, we just don't see it though. We don't, we don't see it. Well, I have to say it's really hard, you know, and so it's like, what is day and date? Like, and so there, I think there's different forms of day and date. And so like, I prefer day and month. And so it's kind of like, you have to look at different you have to again some one of my other mantras is every film's different so you have to see what the release path for your film is and so what makes sense for your film and so you know if you do have some theatrical possibilities then having your dvd and uh, or your um or being on itunes is going to be difficult because certain theaters won't book you so that's why i recommend well maybe having a two-month theatrical window that's if you're going to do theatrical which i'm not a big huge fan of traditional theatrical if you know i'm a much bigger fan of events um but you know it's i don't you know because it's a i i would maybe they don't do i don't know why they don't do it maybe they don't do it because it's a lot of right a lot of work to get all those rights going at the same time if you're doing it on your own you know so that's and so it's sometimes better to push it out but i do recommend though having all try to get all your rights in at least one release window so that the publicity can kind of complement each other so that you can make a bigger dent in the media landscape so that's like three a three to four month window i would recommend you know and you know unless you have a lot of resources then maybe you can stretch it to six months um yeah that's what i'd say to that anything you want to add sherry no, I think that, that, you know, what John said is I think most filmmakers are fearful. They they still do think that there's a possibility of getting some kind of a deal, and they don't want to ruin it by uh, forging ahead. This is kind of going back to when you make a decision, you kind of have to stick with it. If you know from the beginning that you're planning on doing some form of dis- direct distribution, the the traditional distribution's plan B not plan A. There's, it's, it's the other way, you know, it's the other way around of thinking that I, for sure I'm going to do direct distribution, and if it happens to lead to some other distribution deal coming through the door, great. If it doesn't, I haven't waited for anything. Um, and I can tell you for a fact that, because I worked with, you know, Pariah was in the labs, that they were planning something, you know, they were not counting on a, that sale. 
you know, like they had other things in mind that they were going to engage, you know, but then the sale happened, you know, so I think they're, oh, you know, there's hopeful that that's going to happen. You always, you know, hope you're going to be that one tenth of one percent. You know, you hope you're going to be Donald Trump may, well, maybe not personality wise, but maybe, you know, everyone hopes, oh, I, you know, not everyone, but many people hope, God, I hope I'm a millionaire, you know, but it's the same thing of thinking, you know, or God, I hope I'm a billionaire, you know, yeah, I want to be Mark Zuckerberg and I want to be, you know, I want to have a $500 billion IPO, but yeah, there's five people who get that, you know, that's similar to what happened to D. Reese. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, but D. Reese went in thinking, not that that's she had they had another plan well interesting i mean it's just amazing especially when you, when you just go back to the numbers that that you that you're throwing our way today john if you if you're talking 35,000 films made a year and you're talking 600 are going to get you know some sort of attention or a possible distribution deal and yet no 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 600 or, on the festival circuit on the circuit like, so and then and then repeat. down what what's the final number you said i think you know in then, terms of distribution like 40 40, 40. Like 40. so we're talking <laughs> and that's a good year see i'm, I'm being too generous you're talking thirty five thousand. You're talking down to forty, and yet, what are we doing? Why, why do filmmakers keep keep on the same path? You know, like right. it, it, it gets it gets so frustrating. I, you know, fuck if I know. Can I say that? <laughs> That's the question. Every person that comes to me believes they're going to be one of the forty. Everyone. It's just unbelievable, it. and it's good to have faith and passion and belief in yourself. But it's also good to be realistic and to kind of understand there's a new world. You know, and that you know that it's so funny because um oh god i think he, i can say that yeah i interviewed yancy strickler and he felt filmmakers are the most entitled group of artists ever that he encounters that they feel like every that the world owes them something and like uh you know and it's like he was kind of surprised by that and sorry yancy if i'm not but i think i was able to say that on the record and and it, and i find that a little bit you know it's like you know, and I think it's because of that mythology and the history and kind of like, you know, Hollywood and, you know, and it's just like you're and filmmakers are working artists like all other working artists, you know, and it's kind of like you're a, you're it's almost blue collar in nature. You know, it's like you work and you create art and then you connect, you try, you have to go sell it. You know, you have to go connect with people and no one's going to, you know, it's there's. Again, it's a 1% of 1% that are going to have something handed to them on a platter. Hmm. You know, and, and speaking along the, these lines, Sher Sherry, are, are film festivals, are, are they really the first place that filmmakers should be looking uh, to distribute their films or, or have their films seen? Is that is that where we need to be going? Uh, well, it depends on the festival, and it depends on if you're thinking about it being your first place for theatrical they're probably the cheapest place for theatrical for you instead of you know having to try and make agreements with with booking agencies or to go to theaters on their own um you don't have to do that the only thing about it is you're at the mercy of the festival picking you and paying you know a small fee or a fee in general to see what you get um so you have to have two of those plans, either that you're going to do the festival circuit, which we generally have not done with Joffrey. We, we have played very few festivals, and we just went to theaters directly ourselves. Um, or that you're going to, um, you're going to, you know, try your luck and see what happens there. And, I mean, definitely you're piggybacking on the efforts that they make to get people to buy tickets, passes to the festival, that's one less thing you have to do, because at least people are going to come to the festival. Now, if they come to your screening or not, is another situation, and you have to, to rally people to come to see your film instead of somebody else's, but at least they're already aware that this event is happening in their town, um, or within the industry, that's the other consideration, is what are you using the festival circuit to do? Are you using it to connect with an audience, or are you using it for industry attention? Because that's going to determine which festivals you're going to even apply apply to and try to get into. So I think, you know, just to kind of like, um, <clears throat> you have to look at your film, look at what film festivals might be appropriate to it, and more importantly, how festivals fit into the overall strategy of your film. And some films are not appropriate for festivals. It's just they don't, you know, broad comedies, festivals in general. There's a few festivals that are comedy festivals, but most festivals don't cater to broad comedies, for instance. Um, and you have to think about, is this like a real festival darling film that really makes sense to go that route? Or is, are there specific festivals? So for Joffrey, we picked a specific, we picked the top niche festival for that film and we went after it to premiere there. And we decided that if we got that, 
and which we ended up doing, that that would launch our release and that we would then use the publicity for that to ju- to jumpstart the release. And then other festivals, if we got other festivals, we would fold them in and we'd deal with them on a case-by-case basis. And we've been in some other festivals. And frankly, because we have we did make the choice and we've kind of, quote-unquote, suffered maybe a little bit in a traditional festival release because we've had to turn down two prominent film festivals and then a third very prominent like hot docs we didn't get in because they said we played too much he was going to play the film and but you've played too much and then we now have canadian distribution so we can't play vancouver which we were invited to and we couldn't do seattle because we had a week-long run in seattle so we had but this is we made all these decisions and like we were thinking oh should we play at seattle well no we have a week-long run it's like why do even though seattle is a great festival and be wonderful to be in it we had a strategy in place and we adhered to that strategy as far as like what would work best for the release pass path of the film and i'm just going to encourage filmmakers to festivals are one part of your distribution and part of your strategy and to incorporate them with everything else that you need to deal with you are tuned in to film courage our this is our last live episode and it's flying by here on la talk radio from here on out you'll be able to find our archives on filmcourage.com as well as itunes We are in studio with John Reese, and we are on the line with Sherry Candler. You can follow them at John underscore Reese and at Sherry Candler on Twitter. Uh, John, you released your book, Think Outside the Box Office, in 2010, I believe. And yeah, to, I think 2000, fall 2009. It was, okay, well, yeah. I'm so, wow, see, you know. Yeah, time flies. Yeah, Fine. people were saying, we can't believe Film Curd's been around for three years. I can't believe the book has been around uh, for this long as well. And, and you've been talking distribution since then. How did the opportunity sort of come about for you to get into film distribution? So I guess, well, it came about like it comes about for most filmmakers when, you know, we were at Tribeca trying to sell our film and, you know, no one bought it. So, um, you know, so it's just like, you know, it's like, am I going to let my film, what I thought was my best film, die? No, I'm going to go out and, you know, do it my fucking self. And, you know, so excuse my language again. And, <laughs> and uh, you know, and I didn't do it completely myself. And I do preach this if you can get, like, we. I worked with New Video. New Video picked up the DVD and some of the digital rights. CRM had the other digital rights. You know, and I had a, you know, I had people that I was working with, but like the theat, most of it was coordinated by me, as as it is with most filmmakers these days, in a contemporary fashion. And so, in doing that, then um, my producer, executive producer Jeff Levy Hinty, said I should write about it because he hadn't seen a filmmaker do what I was doing before. And so, I talked to Scott McCauley. Scott said, write some articles. I started writing some articles, um, and people responded to them. And I discovered I had a talent for. Writing about a complex system or this complex system in a very practical, matter of fact, step by step fashion, and which I never knew I had that skill before. And people said, write a book. And so, since I often do what people tell me to do, I wrote a book. So, and then that's, you know, it's kind of, I say that tongue in cheek, but people encouraged me to write it. I kind of thought about it. I kind of thought, you know, Ted Hope, frankly, said, look, no one, there is no book like this. You'll be the first one. Get your shit together and write it. And so I did. And there we are. Oh, very nice. Thank you, Ted Hope. Thanks, Ted. Yeah. Um, real quickly, we are running out of time, but with Joffrey, where did you begin with the film? What was your strategy, and uh, what did you do to engage the ballet audience? Wow. So I'll start with um, where we started, and then I'll pass it off to Sherry as far as like what we did to engage the ballet audience. So I started with them, frankly. They they read the book and came to me like about a year ago just as a consulting client. And so I spoke to them and then, um, you know, for a little while and then they said, well, you know, maybe we want you to get more involved. And so I said, well, how about if we write, I write a distribution marketing plan and I, and I talked to Sherry and said, Sherry, cause I knew Sherry liked ballet and Sherry and I have been looking for something to do together. So, you know, I said, Sherry, do you want to work on this with me? And so she said, yes. And so we wrote that plan and then, you know, we are hoping that they were going to engage us in June and then, but things happened. So we started actually in September. Um, and so, which is, and then when you think about starting in September for a launch in January, we're like going out of our minds. I mean, and, but we figured, you know, it's like, this is the best way to do the film. And, you know, it's a good film to do something like this with. And then again, do not recommend this to filmmakers. Do not give yourself only four months from start of audience engagement, like they, there was no audience engagement before September at all. And our launch of our release was January. So it was like the fall, I can't even remember, was just like a 
you know, a, almost like a haze of 16 hour days. <laughs> and like, there was no website, there was no Facebook, there was nothing. It was like a blank, there was no trailer, there was no poster, there was, it was a blank slate. Wow. And so, um, you know, but it it was it was a good opportunity for us and for us to work together. It was a good film that we felt had an audience, and um, you know, and he even said the executive producer Jay Alex said like you get to tr- you'll get to try all these things that you know like practice what you preach, and so it was you know they've been very supportive, and so um, you know that's why we did it on that time schedule, and so I'll let Sherry take the which made Sherry's job of the audience engagement that much more difficult, you know, because of the short timeline. Right. Um, so I could have said, well, this is a ballet fan, ballet film for ballet fans, which in a, in a way, if you look at it, it's a niche audience. Clearly, it's a big niche because ballet is worldwide, and there's always, uh, in the United States, for sure, there's a ballet company in every state, and there's ballet schools almost in every town. So that still makes it very wide. <laughs> if you're working with a modest budget, and I'm not saying that we, um, you know, had a tiny budget, we have a pretty decent budget, but it's still modest by, you know, any any studio standard. It's laughable. Um, so we had to be very careful and very targeted about what we were going to go after and how to spread it out from there. And you know how I, I always say, you've got to catch fire with some small group first. The ballet audience is not small. It's still too big. So I'm looking, thinking, okay, so where do I go? How do I shrink this down even further? Who would be the most interested in seeing a film about the Joffrey Ballet? Former dancers of the Joffrey, maybe? (laughs) Um, That would probably be the best group to start with. They're numerous. They're spread out all over the country and the world. Often they're in high-level positions at other companies and ballet companies, either they're artistic directors or they're ballet masters or something like that. They're easy to find for the most part. Not that I, I wasn't given a database list with everybody's contact details. I had to do that. I had to put it together. Well, we are, we are finally eventually given 12 people, but like two months after we started. Like, right. Oh, here's so, the list that you guys meantime, asked for two months ago. And that's not the producers. That's actually from the Joffrey. And the one thing I will say, I'm just going to jump in and then Sherry, you can, Sherry, you can keep on talking, is that you, part of why we chose the film was because we decided to work on it is because we knew we would have at least in that short time is that the Joffrey would, was kind of, was on board and we could talk to them because it would have been very difficult to engage them had there not been some three, like that would have been insane. In the well, time also to know that the Joffrey didn't make this film. They, right. they weren't involved in the production of the film um, as far as paying for it or have any financial stake in it. So they didn't have to partner with us. No. They didn't have to do it. They could see a reason why it would be a good idea, but we still had to approach them mm-hmm. and put together the case and all that stuff because they didn't. They oh, weren't yeah. financing it or anything. You have to it. convince even the people that you think don't need to be convinced. I mean, everyone, right. people are busy. Like, they've got so many other things to do with their lives that even if they're, you know, people are busy. You have to make compelling cases for people to work with you. Yeah, and, yeah. and I wish we could talk more about the Joffrey because it is such a great film. And I think even people that aren't dance enthusiasts would love it because yeah, it, it really totally. talks about sort of finding a family outside of your own and I'm all gonna, of that. I wish, I wish we had I'm more time. I'm going to take that pull quote right there. <laughs> That's going in the press. <laughs> <laughs> we like it. We like it. Film courage. Um, Sherry, Sherry, forgive us. We're, we have to cut it short. Forgive yeah. us. We're, we're going to have to pick it up with you two um, in our afterlife here. We're going to have to talk a little yeah. bit more about Joffrey. We, we just there's so much ground we wanted to cover. We, we did our best to sort a really of con- lively show. contain you two, but th- there's, there's no there's no Fire. Th- love there's it. no bottling you two up, and, and we just um, <laughs> you know we, we oh, can see why, why we've had you here on, on the show re- repeatedly. Yeah, so. this is sad. I I, I don't want to stop doing this here, but it, yeah. Yeah, if, no, if it is our, our last show, and we, we can't stop. We, we're, yeah. tra- we're trying to keep it going, but we, we have to cut it to a close. Yeah, we do. So, we, We've been speaking with Sherry Candler and John Reese. For more on Sherry and John, please visit johnreese.com, sherrycandler.com, joffreymovie.com, and hybridcinema.net. Uh, Joffrey Mavericks of American Dance uh, limited edition DVD is now on sale. Yeah, watch um, it. It can be purchased awesome. by visiting joffreymovie.com. And we'd like to thank our guy, Ronan Rosner. He's the guy you seldom see or hear, but he plays a huge part in what we do. Once again, we would like to thank Sam and Dina and the entire LA Talk Radio family. And if you have a radio show that you would like to produce, please contact Sam Hassan at latalkradio.com. <laughs>